may be wrong on this. But even if, even if, even if we are, if we, and we go back to my kind of original point, even if we are completely wrong about Can this, stick to would you, uh, yeah, yeah, would you, can, would you concede that the Christian concept of God, I've, I've only gone to the first bit. I know what you're going to say. You're going back to the same thing. Yeah. I, don't, I don't believe that God. Can, can, I, can I make a quick. Sorry, but yeah, my yeah, name is Paul, uh, by the way. And you're, sorry, my name is Paul. Uh, uh, I, I have Paul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi. I'm a Muslim as well, but, uh, with these brothers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, 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 you many years ago. Quite possibly. You're quite possibly. Very, you're looking very. You're looking very yeah. chill. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> it's not because of illness. If people are saying, are you ill? No, I'm not ill. Um, <laughs> you look as though. Uh, you look very. You look as though you've been on a diet. Uh, sort of, yeah, thank you. Uh, I just wanted, so I, I'm coming from the same uh, faith position as these brothers. So, uh, I used to be a Christian, though. One of the things I discovered when I was um, studying John's Gospel and these I am statements, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Before Abraham was I am. I am the resurrection and the life. Uh, as his brother has said, they're only found in one Gospel, the Gospel of John. And, and biblical scholars, who are overwhelmingly Christian, have come to the conclusion in the last 150 years, 99% of them, that the historical Jesus um, is to be found in the earlier Gospels and the earliest Jewish tradition. For example, in Mark and Q, where Jesus never says any of these things. And so the idea is that John, John represents a much more theologically developed uh, portrait of Jesus, um, where the beliefs about Jesus being the light of the world, the beliefs about him being the resurrection of life, have been put on the lips of Jesus. They didn't actually say those words, but um, but the, interject, please. When, when do you think? When when's your understanding when sort of John was written? Do you think? Well, again, I'm not a scholar, so I'll tell you what the scholars uh, in general are saying. Uh, towards the end of the first century, yeah, yeah. John, and it's usually because so it's a lifetime of other eyewitnesses. We're saying. So what? we think. Would you agree that? You no, I, 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 would, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say. And that John was around 90. Yeah, but the, the, the dating is not really the issue for biblical scholars so much as. If Jesus of Nazareth actually walked around Galilee, downtown Judea, wherever, yeah. saying, I am the light of the world, I am the resurrection of the life, yeah. how come no one ever reports him doing this in Matthew, in Luke, in Mark, in Q, in any of the earliest Jewish tradition? Luke, by the way, says at the beginning of his gospel, Dear Theophilus, I'm writing an orderly or accurate account of all that's happened amongst you. So you may know the truth about who Jesus was. He has Jesus never saying any of this. Only in the very latest gospel, the last one to be written, suddenly you get Jesus making these extraordinary public statements as if everyone heard them. So scholars, 99%, and by the way, this is a statement I'm paraphrasing from a, a scholar. 99% of biblical scholars in the last 150 years have concluded that the historical Jesus, the Jesus of history, is not to be found in John so much as in the earlier gospels. So this argument about the context of John and John 17 verse 3 and all that yeah, yeah. is very interesting, but ultimately, if you want to know who the real Jesus was, it's irrelevant. Because very, very likely he didn't go around saying this anyway. This is a later Christian addition, a fiction basically added to the Jesus tradition. It's a distortion of who Jesus really was. Now, these are the conclusions, by the way, of overwhelmingly Christian scholars. And I can name names like Jimmy Dunn, Graham Stanton, etc., etc., etc. People I've read, many of whom I've interviewed from Oxford and Cambridge, John Barton, for example, and others. This is what they all say. And these are, many of these are priests in the Church of England. They're ordained yeah. ministers. Be wary. Be wary. Be wary. That's a, that's a, that's a fantastic point. No, but, you, you, but I notice you laugh when I say that. But you see, these are pious men who believe in Jesus, who believe in God, who care about the truth. And laughing at them well, is not really well, I fitting. I was laughing at them in particular. I was laughing at... Uh, bishops are in favour of blessing saves. But I, well, I wasn't. I was talking about oh, I'm not scholars, I'm not scholars who take their faith and their Bible and Jesus I'm seriously. Not, I'm, I'm, don't misunderstand. They're not atheists. Not, They're not atheists. I'm not okay, good. So Bart Ehrman is an exception. Yeah. He's an atheist and now. Fact, but I, nevertheless, he agrees with them. He agrees with them. Yeah, yeah. Even though he's not a Christian, he agrees with these Christian scholars right. that the historical Jesus is not found so much in John. I mean, I would, I would counter on that. All the Gospels were written 
during the... I mean, the reason they were written is because people were dying off, and therefore they were all written during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses, and therefore Christianity wouldn't have got off the ground if the Gospel writers, you know, whoever they were, misrepresented the works and works of Jesus Christ. It would have just got nowhere. So if, if they were sort of misquoting... I mean, if they were saying, if they're making stuff up, if they're saying, you know, Jesus, you know, you know, turned himself into a ball of fire and, you know, looped the top of the temple seven times, and Christian, you know, everyone was saying, this is rubbish. We were there, we never saw this. Christianity wouldn't get anywhere if that were the case. I mean, it was one of the strengths of Christianity is based on the fact that they were all appealing to objective truth that everyone agreed with. They, they just agreed with the no, way I Jesus got his power from. They, they would say he was either mad or demonic or something like that, but no one would disagree you know, with what he actually did and what he said. But, go, but going back to, I mean, the earlier gospels, let's say Mark, would you agree Mark is probably the earliest? Yep. Yeah, maybe written around... Well, again, uh, it's not so much my own, I'm not a scholar, okay. so what, what I'm trying to do here is to represent what uh, the broad sure. mainstream of scholars who teach at places like Oxford and Cambridge and Yale and Harvard and so on. What are they saying? And most of these are Christian, and they would say that John's Jesus is heavily fictionalized. Right. Uh, and that, that, now Christians say this, ex Christian experts say this. Now, the point about the Gospels is, and this is again a commonplace, they're not like modern biographies. If I was writing a modern biography of Winston Churchill, and I made up statements and put them in Winston Churchill's mouth in the House of Commons in 1941, for example, I would be trashed in the critical reviews but ancient biographies are not like that and the danger is we commit anachronism we read back our modern understanding of biographies back into the first century and that's a basic mistake we, we, wouldn't, we, 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 we don't we don't do that writing a biography of Winston Churchill we wouldn't spend you know over half of the, or a third of the time on his death would we mm. so, start, so, start so the point is what are ancient what are the gospel what, what is the genre of the gospel well, it's and, a and genre right so, it's a so well, what many scholars, and most scholars would say, uh, I, mean, I can quote scholars if you want, but the consensus seems to be that the Gospels are faith documents. They're written from Christian faith. They're not so much concerned with historical accuracy. And we know this because in Matthew, for example, an earlier Gospel, he makes stuff up occasionally. For example, the famous zombie apocalypse, as it's um, called, uh, when, when, Jesus, when, Jesus, when, Jesus, when Jesus allegedly dies, and at the very moment you get big numbers of people in Jerusalem coming out of their tombs, walking around, going back to their families in broad daylight, and presumably living happily ever after. This extraordinary miraculous event is attested by precisely no one else in history. Josephus, the Jewish historian from, um, from the, uh, Israel at that time, fails to mention it. Neither does Luke mention it, or John, or, uh, or the book of Acts, the history of the... This would be the most fantastic uh, evangelistic missionary propaganda if it happened, and no one else knows about it. And virtually every scholar I've ever read on this thinks it's a legend. But Matthew tells us it happened. So we can't always take the Gospels as history. Sometimes they make stuff up. And Matthew changes the words of Jesus in Mark. And I can give you examples. For example, in the earlier Gospel of Mark, Jesus denies he is, he is good, denies he is God in Mark chapter 10, verse 17. A man comes to Jesus and says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Yes. Jesus says, why do you call me good? There is no one good but God alone. That's a verbatim quote from the New Revised Standard Version. If you look at Matthew, who used Mark according to the standard uh, model, he changes Jesus' words. So a man comes to Jesus, I'm repeating what Matthew says. A man comes to Jesus and says, good teacher. They're using the material differently, sure. A man comes to yes, but how do they use it differently and why do they use it? This is the key thing. In Matthew's version, a man comes to say, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, why do you ask me about what is good? If you, if you want to enter into life, obey the commandments. Now, why does Jesus, sorry, why does Matthew change Jesus' word? According to many scholars, including Trinitarian Christians like Jimmy Dunn, okay. the professor at Durham University. Respect. Yeah. I know you believe in it, but our friend here, Nazem, asked him, met him a couple of years ago. He's sadly dead now. Not Nazem, but Jimmy Dunn. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, do you believe in the Trinity? So, yes, I, I believe in the Trinity. So, he's a believing preacher the top biblical scholar, he says in one of his works, the uh, Christology in the Making, I recommend it if you've not read it, that Matthew was obviously embarrassed by Jesus' denial in Mark that he was God. So Matthew, that, that, that's the word he used, embarrassed. Now, John Barton, professor of the Bible at Oxford, who had the privilege of interviewing on my channel, Blogging in Theology, he said that Matthew was being dishonest Absolutely. in changing. Now, John Barton, 
is an ordained minister in the church that you laughed about earlier on, the Church of England. Is it? But he's an ordained minister. I only laughing about those who deny the authority of the scripture. So he doesn't deny the authority of the scripture. So, so John Barton also said that Matthew has been. You watch. You can watch the words on my channel. That Matthew has been dishonest in changing the words of Jesus. Now, why would Matthew change the words of Jesus? Because in the last part of the first century, when Matthew was writing his gospel, so the idea runs. Beliefs about Jesus had risen, you know, he'd been elevated and exalted to a very high status in the minds of Christians at the end of the first century. So Matthew, reflecting the beliefs of his community, changes the words of Jesus to make them conform to later beliefs. But the original saying of Jesus doesn't have that. So here we have an example of the of Christian corruption of the Injil. I've, I've never heard, I mean, that's a fresh line to me, but I've never heard that when Jesus said there's no one quite, you know, there's no one good but God alone, he's denying his divinity. I've heard that in many, if you read a lot of commentaries on Mark chapter 10, and I've read a lot of them, talk to the scholars, which I've done, some of them, they agree with this, that this is a commonplace in academic Christian scholarship. Isn't he saying? I mean, well, that's, okay, that's new to me. But, uh, I mean, I'm not saying... Well, there you are then. I'm not saying, I'm not, uh, you, you, I'm today, not, you, you have I'm learned today saying, what no, your own no, scholars I'm are here, saying I'm about I'm your here. own uh, gospels. Yeah, well, okay. Your own yeah, scholars yeah, are saying this. Okay. I'm not saying this. Your own scholars are saying this. Okay, fair enough. But other, schol other scholars I've, or other preachers and scholars I've, I've read yes. suggest that it's, not, it's nothing to do with... Jesus. Which other scholars might these be? Could you yeah. name a few names? Well... For example, uh, can you give me a name? I suppose John Stott. John Stott is not a biblical scholar. Well, he's a preacher. Well, and, he, and he's been dead for 30 years. But that's not the point. Yeah. But he's not a biblical scholar. He writes popular commentaries as a preacher. Well, okay, he's a commentator. But I'm, I'm talking yeah. about biblical scholars, well, I would uh, specialist I, historians I, I, in the field. Is he right? N.T. Wright, yeah, he is one. Okay. What does he say about this passage? Well, if I understand, if I understand these guys correctly... N.T. Wright, is a, he does qualify, he is oh, one of... Okay. By Thank the way, you. he's a member of the church you laughed about. He's a Church of England bishop. Well, I'm... Okay. He's a bishop in the church you laughed about. Don't, don't misunderstand. <laughs> don't misunderstand. Don't misunderstand. I'm sorry, I'm don't being naughty. Yeah, You're yeah. being naughty, because you know... I am being I'm naughty. Right but he is a bishop in that church. Okay. Yes, he is. I do, the Bishop of Durham, no less. Uh, well, used to be. Used to be. He's at Oxford now, isn't he? So, but, but I was only laughing at Christians who deny the authority of the, I know. Of the Bible. Be so careful, don't, don't be careful when you laugh, because some of your own people you're now quoting are from the very church you laughed about. Uh, sure, sure. Mm. Don't, mis don't, don't misunderstand. I'm sorry, I'm ha having a bit of a, a joke at your expense. Yeah, you are. That's very naughty. <laughs> very naughty. I'm, I'm very not, naughty. Very naughty. Anyway, so mm. but if I understand yes. like Tom Wright yes. correctly, when Jesus says... Uh, no, no one is good apart from God alone. He's calling the rich young ruler to understand the, what is, the quality of God. He's not denying his divinity. He's getting to him to understand the, 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 what, what, he, what his understanding of the word good means. So why did, why did Matthew then feel embarrassed? You see, yeah, yeah, well, your, your explanation about Mark may or may not be true, yeah. but we still have the problem. Yeah. We have Matthew changing the words of Jesus in very particular ways, such that the vast majority of scholars I've read say, well, Matthew is clearly very awkward, embarrassed about what's this statement in Mark, and he changes exactly. Jesus. Exactly. By the way, this is not the only example. There are many examples many, where many Matthew, examples Matthew changes uh, 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 the words of Jesus to make it fit with later ideas. For example, on the law, Ma Matthew teaches a Torah-observant Jesus, where the disciples of Jesus, and us by extension, are meant to obey the Jewish law. This is in direct contradiction to Paul, who said, for example, in Ephesians 2.15, that the law has been abolished. So we have a fundamental contradiction between Matthew and, the, and John in the Bible itself about just it has to live our lives. Well, the, re well, the reign of the law. Yeah. So what's the, what's the bit about the Matthew? Give me that bit again. I missed that bit about the, Matthew's understanding of the law, were you saying? Would uh, contradicts with Paul's understanding of the law? Right. Uh, the, the, the idea being that uh, in Matthew's Gospel, yeah. Jesus preaches a... Sorry. In Matthew's Gospel, the, the Gospel writer presents Jesus as a Torah observant Jew. Yeah. Right? But he also presents the disciples of Jesus as having to obey the law according to Jesus' teaching as well. So we see in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus saying, I've not come to abolish the law and the prophets. And he enjoins the disciples to obey the law, but with a renewed, deeper, um, not just the exterior law, but also the interior intention and motivation from the heart. Precisely. Oops, sorry. Uh, precisely. But notice, 
I mean, that's all fine because that's what Jews should do. And the, by the way, this is not new. The prophet said the same thing. Micah said the same thing, for example. Uh, I did others. But what, Christians should do that as well. No, no, but they don't because they don't. Christians have abandoned the law. For example, do you, do you like a nice ham sandwich occasionally? Well, no, because Jesus declared all food to be. Oh, really? Eaten. Okay. Are you, uh, don't be personal. No, I do. I do, it, I do have a I don't mean personal, but are, are you circumcised? Well, that's a, that's a, that's a very, that's a very, but I'm not, I'm not Okay. You don't have to answer that question. You don't have to ask, you don't have to answer that question. It's a bit, it's a bit. Can you ask no cameras, please? Uh, the reason I, you don't have to answer that question. The reason, I'm, the reason I'm asking that, the reason I'm asking that is, I can tell you that your beloved Church of England, who you've already mentioned, all the main churches no longer require anyone, any male, to be circumcised. And they also do not require people to abstain from pork, and they also do not enjoin a whole bunch of other laws which Jesus... We can wear mixed cotton. Which Jesus says, which Jesus says, you had to obey. So to people sit very loosely on the actual teaching of Jesus in the Christian churches today. Circumcision is obligatory. Yes, but... Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm no scholar, but my understanding is that some Old Testament, some Old Testament laws were fulfilled, and some well, we're still beholden to keep. However, we say you understand. According to who? He's with them. Well, well, according according to, to people like Tom Wright and no, no, I, I read it is in the Bible. I, I know Tom. I know, I know okay, Tom Wright yeah, things. Okay, yeah. I'm talking about the authorities of the faith. Did, does Jesus in Matthew's Gospel say? You no longer have to circumcise your children. You no longer have to abstain from eating pork. You no longer have to obey the law. Did he say that? No, he didn't. He said obey the law. Did Paul say that? Yes. 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 So here we have Christians today, in my view, are following the religion of Paul, the gospel of Paul. Absolutely. Muslims and, and Orthodox Jews, interestingly enough, are actually following a religion much closer to Jesus than Christians do today. This is one of the ironies of history that Muslims now are better followers of Jesus in terms of their practice of the faith in terms of their beliefs about Jesus than Christians are today. It's a great irony of world history, yeah, in my view. But, but, but I mean, just going back to the point about the please, food laws. Please, please, let's go back to food laws. Didn't Jesus declare, you know, all, all food to be... Where did he say that? Ooh, I can tell you, I know the answer. Yeah, I'm just, I know where he's trying to I know, well, I know too. I know exactly where he said that, but do you know, do you know where he said that? Hang on, 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 uh, yes, it is that incident, but it, where it, did he teach, say... Is it when the teachers of the law come up to him and say... Yeah, but which gospel? Which gospel? Uh, it, well, it is, it's in because Mark, the same incident is there in three gospels. Uh, isn't it so Matthew, Mark and Luke? Yes, but w where you said that Jesus said yeah, yeah, yeah. you don't have to... I'm, which I'm gospel? Try, I'm try, I'm try, I mean, I can I'm tell you if you want. Yeah, yeah, no, tell me, tell me, tell me. Tell Mark. Yeah. Mark chapter 7. Yeah, okay. Right. Now, it's interesting. Oh, yes, that's right. Because so it's interesting. And then, and then he went on about what comes out of the In Mark chapter 7, Mark says, in parenthesis, it's not Jesus, by the way, Mark says this, thus he declared all foods clean. That's right. it. Now, if you look at Matthew's version, remember, Matthew changes Mark. <laughs> he edits, deletes, improves, corrects, and frankly, well, no, I can give you dozens of examples on top of my head. This is, this is, this is the second example. In Matthew's example, he deletes that very verse in Mark, Mark chapter 7, where he has Mark, Jesus, where Mark says, thus he declares all things good. And if you read Matthew's version on its own, you would never get the impression that he had declared food, load, food lords uh, uh, abrogated or nullified. You would never get that impression. You would in Mark, though. So what Matthew has done, he's corrected the erroneous Mark, which is clearly not scripture for him. It's now obsolete. It needs to be replaced by Matthew's own version. That's why he wrote at Matthew, to replace Mark. That's the whole point. That exactly. By the way, Christians by the way, that thesis comes from Professor John Barth from the University of Oxford, who said that on my channel. It's a commercial break, by the way. Uh, if you want to hear him say that. Um, so, so, so in Matthew's version, Jesus is not abrogating the law. He still requires the disciples of Jesus to follow the uh, the Torah prohibitions on eating pork. So when 99% of the world's Christians eat pork, they're in direct violation of the teachings of Jesus. When Muslims, as a matter of principle, abstain from pork, as we all do, they're upholding the law of God as endorsed by the Lord Jesus. Who is being a better disciple of Jesus? The Muslims or the Christians? That's my question for you. It's very interesting, but I mean, just... Well, wouldn't you say that Luke, though, though you know, uh, supported the, the Mark and the Yeah, I agree. But Luke has a different view again for Matthew. 
the Gospels disagree with each other. So we have to say who, which is which is the most historically authentic of the very different contradictory portraits we have. So most scholars would say Matthew is actually accurate, historically accurate. But that's precisely the Gospel that Christians don't follow. But Muslims do follow. 